Now I would like to introduce you to our next speaker who will be taking you through some of the finer points of the past six months um, during the conflict and, uh, um, and uh, also be talking about the Russian intervention as well. I now welcome Jay Tharabell. you know, people with a Mac, I suppose, but, yeah, uh, thanks, um, thanks for everyone who attended, uh, really appreciate it, really appreciate that, um, that you came uh, on the 50 year anniversary. Um, because we're discussing the question of the end game, I thought I'd talk about what's been happening over the past, uh, past six months or so. Um, as you know, the Russian intervention has um, gained a lot of attention. Um, so I thought I'd talk about that. My name is Jay Tharapel. I'm a member of Hands Off Syria and a former student here at Sydney University. Um, and I was actually in Syria in the last year, last year in the second half of July. And um, I just thought, like, because of the stories that, like, you know, Jazz was bringing up, it reminded me of one particular story when I was in Damascus, where um, I woke up in the morning and I realised I didn't, I didn't have any Syrian currency. I just had dollars. I walked down to the bank, unfortunately it was closed, and I asked a, a soldier on the side of the street for directions, and he told me where it was, and then when I told him when I came back that it was closed, um, he said, oh, okay, do you need money? And he starts looking through his own wallet, and he starts offering me like a few notes, like a few hundred lira here or there. And that kind of really hit me, because I thought to myself, there's no way if, you, if I was walking through the streets of Australia that a police officer here would do that, you know. Um, but, uh, but there, I mean, a lot of these soldiers, they are just ordinary civilians. A lot of them are conscripts. Um, they're not fighting for a particular individual. A lot of them respect President Assad, but they're not fighting for him. Um, fundamentally, it's about the defense of their country, their factories, their towns, their villages, um, their churches, their mosques, you name it. Um, so I wanted to talk about, um, the Russian intervention. Now, uh, a lot of um, commentators uh, in the West have asked the question, why is it that the Russian intervention has achieved so much more success against ISIS in the first week of its operations than the United States did in an, entirely, uh, in an entire year, or even longer than a year, around 14 months? Um, firstly, it's because Russia and the United States do not have the same objectives. Now, I know that's, a lot of, uh, I know that's obvious to a lot of people, but... When you look at Syria from the standpoint of the Western media, the full reality of this is never actually elaborated upon. On the one hand, the United States wants to overthrow the Syrian government, while Russia wants to defend the Syrian government. This is a major difference. If it wasn't for the United States and their allies in the region, like Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Qatar, um, uh, and Israel, getting involved in the arming, funding, training, and hosting of the various mercenary groups that are fighting against the Syrian government, there probably wouldn't have been a war to, war to begin with. And so when the, the Americans uh, said in, in middle of last year that they were thinking about intervening in Syria to fight against ISIS, and when they eventually did in September, that threw off a lot of people. It certainly confused me because I thought to myself, well, they're, they're, they're threatening to go to war against ISIS, which is a group, that emerged out of Jabhat al-Nusra. Now, Jabhat al-Nusra um, was initially made up of free Syrian army soldiers, which the United States, alongside Turkey, was quite open about backing in the early days. And so when they intervened, I thought, wait, what's going on here? How serious are they about it? Now, the Russian intervention has essentially answered that question, is, my, is the short way of putting it. Um, if you, think, uh, if you think that popular discontent with the Syrian government is enough to explain 
why Syria has become a magnet for heavily armed mercenaries, then unfortunately you haven't been paying attention. The United States alone spent $1 billion um, arming, sorry, training, just training mercenaries to fight against the Syrian government. That was according to uh, documents that were obtained from Edward Snowden uh, by the Washington Post. So that's the first point. The United States actually still wants to overthrow the Syrian government. Which brings me to this quote by Sergei Lavrov, who says, They, that is the United States, didn't touch those ISIS units which were capable of seriously challenging the Syrian government. And uh, the fact that the United States still wants to overthrow the government undermines how seriously we can take their claim about wanting to destroy ISIS. Um, how can they claim to want to destroy ISIS when they also want to overthrow the Syrian government which has the largest armed force that's fighting ISIS and has been fighting ISIS all over Syria for the entire time that ISIS has even been an organization. They fight them in Deir Zor. They fight them in Halab and Aleppo, basically. They fight them in Hasaka. Those are the three main fronts where they've been fighting them for a very, very long time. Um, according to... Um, I mean... I'm not, I'm not basically putting Lavrov's quote out there to basically say, oh, okay, he's right because he's Lavrov. I'm saying that I agree with this. I mean, in hindsight, um, you'd, have to, uh, you'd have to draw the same conclusion because this is what the American-led intervention looked like. You can see on the left-hand side um, what Syria looked like prior to the Americans intervening, and then on the right-hand side, you can see that ISIS territory actually expanded further into Syrian government-held territory. I mean, the Americans played uh, a, a serious role defending Kurdish areas in the north, the YPG-held areas, and in Iraq they played a role in defending the Kurdistan regional government. But because they have this, this um, objective of overthrowing the Syrian government, it's completely unsurprising that the Syrian government actually lost territory to ISIS in that period of time. Remember the ancient ruins of Palmyra that were, um, that were shown on TV last year? Um, yeah, ISIS took that area in May last year at a time when the Americans were apparently bombing them, you know. Um, there's a long road that goes from Deir Zur to Palmyra, and it's in the middle of the desert. The Americans apparently didn't see it, you know, because they have this objective of, of, of seeing the Syrian government overthrown. Um, the main reason and the other reason that Palmyra fell to ISIS is because the Syrian army was forced to divert more of its troops to the northwest of the, the northwest of the country in Idlib where you see that large green patch. The reason they had to divert them there is because Turkey was sending thousands upon thousands of militants, Jabhat al-Nusra, which is al-Qaeda's franchise in Syria, militants into Syria, which then overwhelmed the army positions there and then they were forced to retreat from Idlib. And that's what resulted in the, the, the sieges that, um, that Al-Qaeda has around two towns in Idlib, which is Kefraya and Fuah. Now, uh, that basically forced the Syrian government to re-divert a lot of its army to the northwest. So one can speculate that the purpose of the American-led intervention in Syria was to contain ISIS in such a way that they could be cattle prodded into directing their aggression towards the Syrian army um, and towards the major population centers that, that, um, that are controlled by the government. So the second reason Russia has been more successful against ISIS is that Russia has been far more effective at attacking the financial backbone of ISIS, which is the revenue that they earn from selling stolen Syrian oil. So this is a video, you can find this on, on YouTube, and it just shows the Russians taking out oil tankers. It's estimated that, that so far they've taken out anywhere between 500 to 1,300 oil tankers. And the, the, the part of the reason like that a lot of people speculate why the Americans never went that hard on the actual source of revenue for ISIS is because the biggest buyers of stolen oil, of stolen Syrian oil, are actually Turkey. If you look at this map, um, it shows that, like, uh, that, that uh, ISIS are able to transport their oil. It's around 80,000 barrels a day um, across the border into Iraq. Uh, 
and then basically sell it to sell it to Turkey from there. Um, so that's basically what's been keeping the ISIS war machine going. The Americans did not um, did not in that entire 14 month period that they were there that when the Russians weren't. The Americans did not actually uh, even try and attempt to hit the main source of ISIS funding, which is extremely interesting. Another interesting fact is that the Turkey's largest shipping company. Um, which sells a lot of this oil from its ports, is owned by the president of Turkey, Recep Erdogan's son, who is Bilal Erdogan. Um, and so this is a very, very deep operation. You know, um, it's, it's, This is basically the lifeline that keeps not just ISIS alive, but, um, but also Jabhat al-Nusra before it. This has been going on for a very long time, actually. Like one thing that's not mentioned in our in our media at all, like very often at all, is that in twenty in April twenty thirteen, the European Union actually lifted the oil embargo on Syria. Previously, when the oil was under the, the control of the Syrian government, they had the embargo there because they said it's a brutal regime and we can't buy oil from them. But as soon as it was as it was taken over by Jabhat al Nusra, which is Al Qaeda, they lifted the oil embargo so that they could essentially fuel the insurgency against the Syrian state via the theft of Syria's natural resources. So, yeah, and then, but the point about the Russian intervention is the Russians started targeting um, the, the oil tankers in a big way. And what happened a few months later, we heard that ISIS was forced to cut the salaries of its own fighters in half. And a lot of people attribute that to the Russian intervention. And that's because the Russians kept hitting these oil tanks. I mean, that brings us to the question, why do you think Turkey shot down the Russian fighter jet on the 24th of November? Do you really think it was because Turkey felt threatened? Or was it really because ISIS was having its financial lifeline to Turkey destroyed by Russia? I'd suggest that it was the latter. Um, and just as I mentioned that uh, the European Union has been like part of this by buying stolen Syrian oil, by lifting that embargo, um, uh, there's also the financial sanctions that the United States has imposed on Syria. When countries need to import goods, often it goes through a financial center that's based in London or New York. I mean, the fact is that the United States has a hegemonic role in world finance. And so the sanctions have meant that it's very, very difficult for, for Syrians to purchase the things that they need. When I went to Syria, we had to basically go in there with hard cash because none of your credit cards will work there. And so this is what led to the massive deterioration in the purchasing power of the Syrian pound. Um, so on the one hand, it's oil, oil is being stolen. It's being facilitated by NATO and the EU. And on top of that, there are financial sanctions which are making it difficult for the Syrian government to buy the medicine that it needs, to buy... Um, the, anything that it needs under conditions of war. The, the question of medicine is, the, the, the inability to buy medicine is even more cruel when you consider that the, the mercenaries backed by, backed by NATO and their allies in the region have attacked two-thirds of the hospitals in Syria. When we met the health ministry in Syria, in Damascus, this is what he told us. He said that prior to the war, Syria was self-sufficient in 80% of its medicine, and now they had to import a lot of these medicine, and the, the task of importing medicine was even more difficult because of the sanctions. You know. Much to the anger of the United States, Russia also has no hesitations about bombing the militias that the United States and CIA are continuing to support. Ever since the Russian campaign began on the 30th of September last year, if you turned on your news, you'd hear um, almost kind of these, these pathetic complaints from the media where they'd say, Russia, they're not hitting ISIS, they're hitting the Syrian opposition, the poor Syrian opposition, the moderate rebels. Who are the moderate rebels? Is a question that's very rarely asked in our media because it's an uncomfortable one. Here they are. It's basically them. Um, Jabhat al-Nusra, Ahrar al-Sham, Jaysh al-Islam, Faylaq al-Sham, and the so-called Free Syrian Army. All of those groups are basically allied, allied to the al-Nusra front in the top left-hand corner, which is an al-Qaeda franchise. They have a very similar ideology. The Free Syrian Army is a loose band of, of militias. They vary in terms of, 
how serious they are about their Islamism. And one of their fronts, which is the Southern Front, is currently like not on good terms with al-Nusra. Um, but generally speaking, they have a similar ideology anyway. You know, so that's, that's what the media says when they talk about the Syrian opposition, al-Qaeda. So calling them the Syrian opposition makes them sound like a civilian-led movement when really it's a euphemism for the moderate rebels, which is a euphemism for these guys. You know, so according to, um, uh, according to James Clapper, who's the U.S. Uh, Director of National Intelligence, moderate these days is increasingly becoming anyone who is not affiliated with ISIS. So it's a meaningless term. Um, straight from the horse's mouth. So that means that when you heard criticisms on your TV criticizing Russia for attacking moderates, really they're talking about the al-Nusra Front, which is al-Qaeda's franchise in Syria, and other groups with similar ideological motivations. I remember this is um, uh, John McCain speaking, where he says, I can absolutely confirm to you that there were Russian strikes against our free Syrian army groups that have been armed and trained by the CIA because we have communications with them there. The thing about John McCain is he's angry at Obama for not being like even more supportive of the mercenaries fighting the Syrian state. Um, and so that's his dig at Obama for being too soft, you know, that Obama hasn't done enough to destroy Syria, is John McCain's line. Moving on to the siege of Madaya and Zabadani, at the beginning of the year, uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, these two towns um, that uh, that have been under siege. Um, they're they're close to the Lebanese border, and um, they're under the control. These two towns are under the control of um, of three militias, basically. So Ahrar al Sham, um, Jabhat al Nusra, and the Free Syrian Army. A few Free Syrian Army militias. Um, so. The population of these towns is roughly 23,000, including about 600 to 1,000 militants. Earlier this year in January, the Western corporate media um, was yet again leading the charge against the Syrian government, accusing it of starving the civilian population of these two towns. Um, this situation was exploited by turning it into a propaganda weapon against the, against the Syrian government. And by propaganda, this is what I mean. Um, it's actually, what actually happened is that the aid deliveries by the Syrian government were actually going to those towns, but they were being hoarded. They were basically being, like, monopolized by the, the insurgents who control it. And then they started taking opportunistic photos of people's, people experiencing malnutrition. Um, and so that photo basically sums it up. Um, so photos began appearing. Um, which claimed to show emaciated bodies from Madaya like the following, but upon closer inspection, these turned out to be fakes. The one on the left uh, is supposed to show um, uh, uh, a young Syrian girl, um, like before and after, so when she was healthy and after she was starved. Turns out that it's a, woman, that it's a young girl from Lebanon. The one on the right um, is actually a photo of a refugee from Europe in 2009. So if the situation was as dire as these media outlets were, were suggesting that it was, there would have been no reason that they would have to fabricate these stories as they did. Now, I personally don't doubt that people are suffering in Mandaya and in Zabadani and ex experiencing malnutrition, but is it really the entire fault of the Syrian government or does our media present it that way because they're promoting Washington's regime change agenda? The grim reality is that sieges are an inevitable aspect of warfare. Nobody likes them. They happen when one army encircles another army within a town or city and then demands that that army surrender. Um, this means that the only way for the government to supply these towns with food, water and medicine is by handing them over to the armed forces that actually control that town. You can't hand it over to anyone else. You can't hand it over to the civilians because the civilians aren't the ones on the edge of the city. It's the armed militias. Um, so here's, the, here's the, the question that the media should have been asking. Why, why are the Al-Qaeda militants inside these towns not starving? Um, they had footage where they showed um, Syrians and they were protesting and they were quite visibly upset about the lack of food, but the militants didn't seem to, seem to be quite well fed and happy themselves. 
Um, it's simple. It's because they hoarded the supplies for themselves. What was rarely mentioned in our media is that Al-Qaeda-linked militants who control those towns have been um, keeping the food for themselves or selling it to the, to, the, uh, to the residents at extortionate prices, which is why inflation is so high. The Syrian government actually has a history of, de of delivering aid to these areas. The last deliveries were made in mid-January uh, this year, and the ones before were made in mid-October last year. In mid-October, they provided that, those areas with enough food to last for two months. So that should have been good for until the end of December. Um, so at the end of the day, as soon as the, uh, the supplies enter these areas, the Syrian government loses control over who it's being delivered to. Another reality that isn't mentioned is that the Western corporate media doesn't show all the pro-government protests that have taken place inside Madaya. So if you have a look here, I mean, these are videos that you can find online of uh, the people showing their support for the government within these areas. And we're supposed to believe that the people inside these areas are being oppressed by the Syrian government and not by the Al-Qaeda militias who have held them hostage, essentially. Hmm. I mean, generally speaking, over the course of the war, the Western corporate media has tended to downplay uh, the amount of support that the Syrian government has. Um, and on that, on that note, I'd like to once again reiterate the main reasons why I've been so... Uh, vociferous in supporting the Syrian government over the past five years. Firstly, the Syrian government represents the general will of its people. In a war situation, when forces trying to overthrow the state are backed by foreign powers and represent a sectarian and extremely reactionary and quite frankly scary ideology to a lot of Syrians who aren't used to living under that kind of a system, um, then naturally uh, a lot of Syrians said, Look, I have my issues with the Syrian government, but when it comes to this war, when, when it's a war between what I have now and the forces that are trying to overthrow the state, generally speaking, there is no institution in Syria that is more popular than the Syrian Arab army. Um, and the other reason is because uh, I actually have a great deal of respect for what Syria has been able to achieve um, ever since the Ba'ath Party took power in 1963. Um, a lot of people don't realize that before the war started, Syria um, had a per capita GDP of maybe only $2,000 to $3,000. But when it came to life expectancy, education, the status of women, health care, Syria was, relatively speaking, a beacon of progress compared to all the other countries in the Middle East. Um, and the fact, uh, um, Jazz already touched on this, but the fact that the last presidential elections got 73% voter turnout, which is higher than a lot of countries in, in the West, um, is, is just one of the very, very many signs that the majority of Syrians do not, at the very least, support the overthrow of their state, but that a lot of them see in the government that they have a lot of things that are progressive and worth defending. And they understand that if their government were to be overthrown, it would usher in a dark, dark chapter in the pages of Syrian history. And on that note, thank you very much.